Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Dave Williams. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, this is going to be a focused chat about log server. I'm well aware I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'll try and keep to the details and hope you uh, get all the necessary information. It's quite a tricky one for me, this. Normally when I present, it's about a product that I've worked on, created, written, um, worked on for years. Uh, and of course, this is a completely different way around. It's a product that's uh, purchased, installed, and used. So it's uh, just a different focus. Um, as in all classic systems, one has to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I've told you. So this is the agenda. We're just going to touch on why we chose it, how the implementation worked, and then some more detailed stuff about how to find where the source is for log server, um, how to, these little wrinkles uh, about things you, good to know. The, they are kind of documented, but they're not easily obtainable. Um, the pretty part, the lovely dashboards that everybody loves that sing and dance and make, you, make your managers feel happy. Uh, a few things about system performance, because like all software packages, it eats resource, it does things. There may be things you might want to do better. And some final conclusions. So let's quickly get over what I like to call the ego slides. Uh, I'm UK based, you may have noticed the accent. Um, works on more or less everything. Uh, I work for a French company. You've no idea how much joy that causes me as a British person. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I've worked on lots of stuff. I now work on um, technical architects, so designs. With system monitoring, I'm starting in the bad old days of OpenView and NetView and IBM stuff, and then moved on to, we had a product called OpenMaster. Started with NetSaint, was responsible for the, f the first working port, or I'd suggest, of NetSaint under AIX. Then onto Nagios, Nagios Core, Nagios XI, lots of things. Let's get down to the business. Why choose Nagios Log Server? Well, I was a about this time last year, strangely enough, beginning to get involved in a contract in the UK that's about $40 million. And in the contract, there was one lovely line that said, all logs must be recorded and analyzable. It's the one line. Lovely. Um, so there had to be something to absorb this stuff. Syslog wasn't going to be the game, really. Um, I'd already built uh, an Elkin log stash system, um, not using Kibana, but for previous uses. I'd used Splunk before uh, to good effect, um, but if you're anything like me, uh, you'd have probably used Splunk to solve a particular point problem at the time because you couldn't really afford all that cost of all that bandwidth, all that stuff coming at you, so little focus problem. Um, and then I was here last year, uh, and Ethan announced Look Server. This seems a good idea, I thought. Um, and that really came from the previous year when we'd had a dev meet and discussed about you know, what things would we really like to, what, what problems have we got? And one of the problems that came out was about, we've all got logs, we'd all like to do logging analysis better. Uh, so it kind of came that way. Uh, it seemed a cost-effective option. Well, it was then because there was a lovely bargain going on about the $995 two instance deal, uh, which suited my organization down to the ground, frankly. Um, and the, and, the, and the real kicker was it allowed us to have a multi-use instance because part of the requirement is to let customers see what's going on. They sometimes, uh, I'm a managed services person, customers sometimes know more about their systems than you do. And therefore, it's, it's a help to everybody if they can see some of the logs. They can't destroy things. They can only see things that relate to them. But it can be advantageous. So having a controlled access different parts of the log server made a big amount of sense to us. Um, now, I'm a sysadmin, I'm a op, dev op, however you want to call it, so I really like knowing what's going on. Uh, I don't like necessarily installing virtual machines and not being able to get under the covers, basically. I'm very pleased with this product, and it comes in a tar file, and I can install it, yes. So I can play with it at that stage uh, and change things. Um, this, this, this slide is really saying stuff, uh, it, the install doesn't quite work. Uh, but it's not a big problem. 
And again, it's a view of the world that says that when you install things, the internet is available to you. Well, quite often I work in environments where the last thing I'm going to allow this system to connect to is the internet, and it will never connect to the internet. Um, and so presumptions like that are easy to overcome. Um, so those two slides are really for if people refer back to them and say, well, it's failing prereqs, yes, that's why. It, it will always fail. The next thing that hits you is, I built this, it's lovely. I wish I'd paid more attention to some of the notes because I'm now actually storing all my logs on this same file system that I've installed my product. This is not a good thing. You can't in any way describe it as a good thing. But it is dead easy to say, actually, no, stop. Change a part parameter. All this stuff, data is now going over there on uh, near line storage or wherever you want to put it. Um, but to why is it just it's just a nice way of feeling that people have thought about this system when it was created so you start to feel better about it um, the other thing that I found really impressive was that uh, very quickly built us instance um, recording data uh, now I need two instances because I need a disaster recovery I need to be able to continue if one instance fails how hard is this going to be and the answer is it's not I just went to another system, installed the product, and a final step of the installation process said, this is the cluster UID of my original. The two talked to each other, started spreading shards around underneath, and it all kicked off beautifully. I will say, it can take some time for the cluster to catch up. You can spend a worrisome couple of days looking at a status that says yellow, but it is doing it. Eventually it goes green. Uh, for those who don't know, underneath, everybody says it's an elk. What's, what's an elk? Well, this is what elk looks like, which is kind of backwards, really. Uh, Kibana is what you use to look at the stuff. Cool. Elasticsearch is the magic object that's doing the, the thing about rationalizing, indexing everything. It indexes everything. And then it's using Logstash to hold all the data. So all that stuff comes into Logstash. Logstash pushes into Elasticsearch. You look at Elasticsearch from Kibana. Um, help yourself with how many Logstash instances you want, providing you pay for the licensing. It's not an issue. Right, no, no. Installed, working, clustered sources. What do I want to pull into it? And by its nature, it has a number of source definitions that are freely available. Syslog. Syslog is good. Um, Syslog from other systems. That's quite good as well, really. Um, because uh, if you're using any kind of core or XI implementation, you'll probably be using SNMPTT, the trap translator. One of the options there is he'll put his traps on syslog. Well, that's handy. Um, you get a copy of NXLog if you want to go and pull actual Windows logs out. Um, yeah, I'm my, half and half on this, whether you actually want to pull event logs back or whether you want to do cleverer things on the Windows source rather than pull everything back but but those sources are in the system ready to configure click go it works um, again sysadmin type guy I'm I'm interested in the VMs that are running in a cluster I'm more interested in the actual thing that's providing the cluster the ESL, ESXi instances for example um, there's, here's a little way you can get the log straight out of EXI and you can just send them off straight into log server. Now, a lot of the times I've been doing, I've done this in the past. Uh, I started to create this slide set and thought, oh yes, this is it. And I kept on bumping up against things that have been produced by Nagios Enterprises. They actually are documenting all of this stuff bit by bit. So the places where I've walked, uh, sort of brushing the undergrowth out of the way, there's a lot of stuff being now provided that you can actually just pick up and use. Uh, there was talks earlier in the, in the kickoff about NetFlow analysis. NetFlow generates logs. Now, NetFlow generates, if you let it, logs. I mean, these are big things. Um, built into log server is a little NetFlow input stream. So it can already catch NetFlow. 
both version 5 and 9. The only issue you might get with that is it's not necessarily as quick as you might like. It's kind of good for a few switches, but if you try and put a Cisco Nexus into it, it'll choke. <laughs> it really does choke. But as we'll see a bit later, you can get around that. Now, if anybody's ever seen me present in the previous years, I always managed to get a bit of Raspberry Pi in somewhere, and so here it is. This is really about mentioning the, because no presentation is complete without a mention of the Internet of Things, because that's the latest bus phrase, so let's get it in. This, in this case, is a little Raspberry Pi with a distance sensor, sensor and it's shipping stuff as a log, and the, the data it ships is simply how close something is to it. Arbitrary, I mean. But the nice thing is, this is just a piece of JSON. We're just stringing a bit of JSON. Now, anything in the Internet of Things world should be capable of stringing out six or ten lines of JSON. It's not a big thing, so we stand a chance of being able to take it and absorb it and do something with it. Uh, it's a kind of example here. We just put a tag on uh, the output to say its distance and a, do and a date timestamp. The little block in the right hand corner is the code necessary to do that. It's the Python running in the Pi. So if I can squeeze it into that size, it's not making a big impact on whatever you do with your Internet of Things, whether it's a remote door handle or a remote light bulb. That's not a lot of code, really to find out the light bulb's on, the light bulb's off. And that's the sort of thing you get out. Yes, that is the dashboard. And a little graph. How meaningless is that? Yes, it's just same distance, same distance. <laughs> Further away, same distance. But it's not really meant to be used that in a dashboard. It's meant to just record what has happened, what you have logged. So it's just a, that's just a hint of what you might do with a very, very, very small object which you may have many, many thousands of. I came to the States to do this presentation and I'm going away with a toy. You, you cannot believe what I'm going to do to that toy, but it will become part of the Internet of Things, the boundary patroller of my home, I suspect, uh, feeding into a log server. Why not? This is where we get to the useful things to know. How do, you put, how do you install Logstash plugins? There are lots of plugins out there. We'll come to just how many there are, but there are lots. You have to remember that the Nagios log server is based, in the first instance, on open software. And that open software is worked on and changed and modified and enhanced 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by strange people like me. And so there's a lot of plugins. And how do you do it? It's very easy. Install a plugin. That really is it. If you're already using ArcSight to log things, you can then put the handler in and get ArcSight to log to an Agios log server. Why not? Um, when you do an update, lots of things happen under the covers. Um, and if you run the system in data allocation mode, it can take you days, if not weeks, for that update to apply. So it's a nice little document there that says how to pause data collection. Not, not lose, we're not losing data, we're just pausing it whilst we do our update. Um, believe me, that can make a whole lot of difference in your life, waiting for things to work and not. Uh, and that filter at the bottom. Uh, when you first fire up, you're, you're, you, you're very excited, you paid your money, you've got your log server, you put in syslog, and you fire it up. I think, what do I run first? I know, show me what's on the log. There's a little thing that says, show me the log. And before your very eyes, the whole screen fills up with log file entries. You think, this is really good, this is really good. And then you go, actually, no, it's just telling me that log file, log server's running every five minutes. Oh, that's the yards of it. Uh, and in between those are things you want to look at. So that bottom filter kills all of the stuff that comes from log server telling you that it's running itself. So um, one of my favorite ones. Uh, uh, and this is just a standard, can I catch the label? Can I catch what program it is? 
And the, the nice thing about the enhanced Kibana in, interface inside Log Server is that you can generate this just by one single click. You'll find a little field that says, generate a filter that deletes this entry. So you go down the table, you say, I don't like that one. Click on the little filter that says, I've generated a filter, put it in the top, go on. You don't have to worry too much about the syntax. It's only when you get down, down and dirty, trying to do things that are complicated, multivariable stuff, maybe the click and drop doesn't work. But most of the time, you certainly can test very quickly. Get used to this. It's just Jason, but you will be asking the question of your local host loads of times. So curl x get 9200. I really recommend pretty because it comes back horrible otherwise. And this is just what's the status? Well, it's yellow. I've seen that a lot. Um, well, but you'll be using that command a lot. If you're like me, wanting to poke under the covers a little bit uh, and find out really what's going on, then CLI stuff like this uh, will come out. Just get used to it. Uh, Eric's doing another track. And I know how he loves his fireworks, so he's doing about how to monitor it. But the basics are pretty obvious. Um, use that 9200 port to get some information back about what's going on. Uh, use check prop to find out that the processes are actually running. This is all pretty boring, pretty basic stuff. I know Eric's touching on it. I have no way I want to steal his thunder. He's bigger than me, so we'll leave it there. I think you may wonder, why have I put a section about uninstall? Why would you do that? Well, again, I'm the kind of guy who plays with stuff, changes the performance parameters, maybe try something really new. I just want to take it out of the way and do it again. I want to take it out of the way and do it again. It just, and so it was a little fiddly, but there you go. Take all those things out. You can reinstall. It's always that thing where you've typed in, I really wish I hadn't typed that as part of an install script. Okay, I can take it out. Um, all the stuff we've seen so far, things have been happening above port number 1024 for, for good reason. Um, sometimes you cannot influence the equipment that's sending you data. Hello, NetApp, I'm looking at you. Uh, and it will send you stuff on the old traditional syslog port 514, which is a privileged port. Um, again, pretty easy to do. Once I found out how to do it, of course, Nagios then published a document to tell everybody, but that's life. But it's a very simple thing. But it's to, yeah, to understand, it's not impossible to take stuff in the privileged port status. You just have to make a certain amount of changes. When we saw that lovely block diagram, we saw Logstash with all that data sending things to Elasticsearch. Now, in case you haven't noticed, Logstash is a big beast. It's a massive Java chunk um, that would, if it had any ambition, just take over the world. So no, you don't necessarily, especially in the, in, the, in the world of Internet of Things, need that monster. What you want is something that will produce the input files. And so there's well, something called Lumberjack. You can, it's another open source thing, isn't it? Let's just keep on the theme. Uh, now called Logstash Forwarder, just a tighter piece of code um, will de generate stuff that will go into Elasticsearch. Now, the, the interesting thing here is um, that data, when it's shipped, is secured over SSL. Uh, the actual size of that particular product fits in an Amazon uh, micro instance. So some would say it's free, some would not. Um, but it doesn't allow you to say, I can have this really small instance that maybe I feed data to, but it can securely send to my Elasticsearch cluster. It's just another input to my Elasticsearch cluster. So you start to think, if I'm, Amazon, if I'm, if I'm gonna ramp up 100 instances in the next three minutes, I might need somewhere for them all to send their log information to, and on, and then when I ramp it down two minutes later, what I don't want to do is pay for enormous instances that contain Logstash because it's huge, when I can just have a little, one tiny little one. So, nice, nice little product. 
again, very easy to do. Um, there actually are prepackaged stuff. Uh, the machine's available on Amazon for it. This is over 180, and I'm, that was a few weeks ago when I counted, but there's a lot of different things that already happen inside Logstash. So there's a lot of different things you can already do inside Log Server. You just have to be slightly adventurous. This, the rest of this is a, is a filter. Um, and what it's really trying to say is, oh look, isn't that interesting? Someone's already built an embedded Nagios NSCA filter. So the way that we have syslog embedded and the way that we have um, other inputs embedded, we can now say, if I, if I see this syslog entry and it's from Jenkins, and I've just happened to install it on the cluster because I'm expanding, on the cracking grok pass failure. Grok pass failure is about, if you do a set of tests, if they all succeed, then that flag doesn't exist. It's a kind of catch at, at the bottom, it's a breakout clause at the, at the bottom of a set of conditions. But already, internally inside the system, you can just go send NSA, here's the NSA config, the way we always used to do it, host to send it to, the message I want to send. So it's quite a familiar, familiar scenario. Dashboards, right. You get a set of dashboards with log server, which are very, very pretty. Uh, how much use are they? Let's have a look. So here we have an Apache dashboard. This is the standard Apache dashboard. The inputs are file-based, so you just basically point out access.log, error.log, um, tell the system. And that, that lovely pie chart in the middle is um, status codes. Seems to be getting quite a lot of sum, are they? So that's what they are. It's not the best system in the world, is it? There's a lot of 404s there. Um, what's going on there? The nice thing about the implementation of Kibana under log server is I can now click on that and say, OK, show me the 404s. And there they are, broken out, which is much more interesting to me because I can then say that my instance of Thruck hasn't got win40.jpg. So every time it tries to display a page, it's getting a 404 out of it. Now, trivial enough example, but it means that I can, two clicks, and I can say, I can fix that. I know exactly what the problem is. I know exactly what to do to fix it, and I can eliminate it. So for a standard default dashboard, not necessarily a bad thing. Final dashboard. Yes, you can get this sexy. This actually is uh, a, ne a Cisco Nexus uh, giving it a, not a much stick, actually. A full chat, it really does go. Now, this is a, a massive improvement on the standard Cisco offering. When you try and monitor a Nexus it's too, with NetFlow, it's too fast. All that Cisco can offer you is a sample. They actually sample the data and then give you that. Using this hookup, you can actually take real-time data flat out. So this is a, in this case, it's only a 10 gig feed, but I don't know. So there's a, a way of hooking this up and saying, I can actually take all of it, more than a manufacturer can handle, and put it into Log Server. It has its moments. If you have managers in the room, impress them with this. <laughs> And again, it's just a dashboard saying this is, this is our traffic proportionally, type of traffic, and this is where it's coming from. You could put them in a room and they could look at that for hours, couldn't they? <laughs> now, this doesn't come without a cost. You've got to do something. You've got to make the thing work. Uh, and there are design decisions uh, you can make. Now, Elasticsearch, Indexes everything. There is, no, there is nothing that is double negative, sorry. There is nothing that is not important to it. It tries to keep this in memory. This is not a good thing. <laughs> you will use all of your memory. Um, and you have to kind of make a decision. So this is a, a customer by customer, slice by slice decision. Um, 
how much data do I need to refer to instantly? And then you should just massage the Java heap. I think if you only want to look at the last two or three days because your logs are being used for fixing things, not necessarily archiving, but fixing problems, if you haven't heard about a problem after two days, it's not a problem then, is it? Uh, and so you could actually bring the memory pressure down by changing the memory uh, partitioning. Um, this one caught me on someone else's system. Someone had enabled Why do you do swap with a Unix-based system? Please don't. Um, and this just went berserk because it then ate the memory, went into swap, the whole system chunk kind of died. Very embarrassing all around. Um, you've got a way of locking that, stopping um, the system actually doing that itself. So you can play that kind of game. You should be forcing the number of max files. You should be forcing um, security limits. So this is just really saying, yes, it's a lovely product. Yes, it's glitzy and, and you drag and drop, and it's very, very marvelous. But underneath is, a, is an engine that's doing things. And that engine needs, needs some help occasionally to do things efficiently and the way you want it to. Okay, this is, this is me. Um, it's just a fact that out in the world, um, after 64 gig, Elasticsearch doesn't really sort of scale terribly well. So, although it might be nice to think I could put 128 gig machine in and no, don't do it, just go horizontally, because it just might, you'll get no benefit out of it. Um, and Troy talked earlier about um, SSD tuning for disk array. Under the covers in Elasticsearch, you can actually start to say, put the indices over here in a file system, which can be SSD based, and the shards over there, which is near, near line based. So, you, again, performance tuning, making it work the way you want it to. Um, there are a number of things you can play, but it's all about think about the engine that's underneath and what it's actually doing and what you can do with it in terms of replication of shards. Do you really need to do that? Do you want smaller shards? Um, want to do the indexing here, move it over there later. Ah, conclusions. Well, also, no presentation is complete without a fly-in, is it? You can't do this at a Raspberry Pi. This is really pointing a finger up and saying, it's processor and memory intensive, <laughs> okay? Um, to get it to work, it requires a lot of muscle. However, if you're interested in doing it on a Raspberry Pi, talk to me afterwards, and I'll give you a couple of hints, because it's not totally impossible. There's no point in having this product unless you've got log sources that matter. So if you have something that doesn't actually, if you've got something that doesn't produce a log, or just sends you as an MP alerts, well, maybe we can still get that, but that's no use. <laughs> it's no use to, if someone says to you, yes, it's all this stuff is in a data center over there, they don't allow you to transmit anything outside the data center. Oh, that could be interesting as well. Get logs that matter. Matter to the business, matter to what you're actually trying to do. Logs are funny things. Logs have information. Nothing but information. They're words and numbers and strange symbols. They mean something, but you have to understand what they mean and what they mean to you. Um, I have a classic, I didn't put it in the slide, one of my uh, instances suddenly went berserk with this massive message that said, all the fans have been turned off in a, in a switch. Could be true. They've all gone. So I, I rang the site, I said, all the fans have gone apart from one. And the answer was, yes, unfortunately, we ordered some hardware that didn't come with the fans, we forgot to order them. So we've taken some out and shared them around, which is kind of... <laughs> it's like, yeah, thanks for that. <clears throat> if you'd told me, I would have put a filter on that said, you know, one is enough. And that's, you know, so, you know, one is enough. You can tell people when you, you know, out of the four, some have gone. Well, providing what, there's one left, just carry on. So it's about make sense to your organization. So, okay, I can change that. 
uh, stuff that lives at 95% of its utilization. If your organization says that is, the, that is the status quo, well, don't log it then. Really don't. And the other thing is, anything can be a log file. It doesn't really matter. If you're willing to write something that passes it on input, you can make it a log file. And that's essentially what you do. If you've got some of the more sicker applications that just dump stuff out to an error file occasionally, as long as it's halfway consistent, as long as there's some word or phrase or mystic indicator that tells you where to start and stop about that message, then you can write a passing schema that will make it meaningful. If you can make it meaningful, you can decide what to do about it. Alert, not alert, report, not report. So you shouldn't really give up the fact that the thing doesn't do syslog. Does it tip anything out anywhere? In which case, I can make something out of that. Now, you see, the last man was waving his hands at me from the back of the room, which you fortunately can't see. It's not a pretty sight. So I've now got to the bit where I say, any questions now? I'd like you to be kind here, because this is about implementing a product. I haven't really sort of beaten it to death. I've not been part of its development, but... Uh, if you want to ask me questions about how it went and how it didn't go, and things I'd not do again, uh, this is your big moment. Feel free to uh, put your hands in the air and I will come personally with the microphone. Anybody have any questions? So Dave, you had mentioned that uh, obviously you, you can't really easily deploy the product in a Raspberry Pi, but I'm guessing, have you, have you tried uh, the Logstash forwarder that works. on a Pi? That works. That, that works well. That, I thought that that would be a, a good implementation. It's nice and small and uh, compact, and you could put yeah. it in a data center. Yes, it works beautifully. It's in the same sort of scenarios as... Um, like Mod Gibbon extension devices, then you can put a log slash forwarder as a, as a Pi just connected to the network. You're always going to have bandwidth problems because you can't beat 75 meg or so of, of the Ethernet. But yes, it works beautifully. Any other questions for Dave? Uh, based on your use of it so far, what have you seen as kind of the key advantages over using Nagios Log Server versus uh, the open source Kibana front end? The two big ones are um, user control, where I can, I can let um, what I call those cursed users, uh, but they're the people who pay me, uh, onto the system. Because I'm a, I'm a great believer in um, there's one truth. There's one, there's one source of information. Uh, in fact, as I as a service provider see it, I believe the customer should see the same source. Um, so that's very key. And I have no doubt that I will be able to drop it, um, you know, I have to put a hand up here. Technical architect level, install it, make it work. Give it to systems operations to make it happen day after day after day. I have no qualms that that's gonna happen. It's very easy to do. Thank you. Any other questions? David, do you have any uh, upcoming projects, anything you're currently working on you'd like to share with us? Apart from making my little uh, droid um, <laughs> feed stuff in, because I think it's going to be remarkable to make it give geographic, real-time geographic information. Um, finishing off this project, to understand the infrastructure I'm feeding into it, think of two data centers connected by dark fiber with... 150 terabytes of three-pass storage, four HP clusters, uh, blades, um, net, net backup amp appliances, Barracuda, um, email processing, uh, Fortinet firewalls, oh dear, Citrix, uh, Citrix um, load balancers, all into one place. So I really must get that finished. You mentioned about the net flow limitation of yeah. it, uh, and, but you said that there is a potential workaround for yes. uh, having it parse additional net flow. Can you talk a little more about that? There's a, you can use a, some other product set, shall we say. It's really about taking the IP flow and pushing it out. 
Um, if you talk to me afterwards, I'll tell you all about the products that I use to do that. But they're, 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 they're open source product. It's just a, a different way of doing it. But it's just because the NetFlow, built-in NetFlow, is Java-based, it's just not capable of handling that through. But if you actually put it, attack it with particular point solutions, then you can do it. But yeah, see me afterwards, and I'll tell you the product. Of it. Anyone else? All right, that looks like it. Uh, unless there's anything else you'd like to uh, share with us, Dave. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. Once again, uh, technical assistant, or uh, architect for Atos, Dave Williams. Thank you, Dave.